Hey, good morning. Hey, if you're new, I'm Charlie, uh, lead pastor here at The Grove, and really glad all of you are worshiping with us today. So glad that you are here. Uh, if you're online, really glad you guys are here as well. And um, I'm, I'm a little bit excited today because I've been talking to the guy who's going to act as member here, who's going to act kind of as our general contractor for this new space. Uh, the, the, the owners have been working on it, doing some stuff to prep it. Um, kind of a punch, working through a punch list of stuff, and so we've been doing all that. And now this week, we're going to start doing some of our work on it, which I'm really grateful for. I don't know if you were here last week, but we had a, a child dedication for uh, Isabel Littleton, and the youth came in to see it, and there was almost 30 of them there. And I, can't, I just couldn't even imagine what that would have looked like back there. And then the elementary kids are just bursting, and it's just going to be so great. It's going to be great that they have this kind of this room to grow and just to... And to feel honored and valued, I'm so looking forward to it over these next few weeks. And I want to say thanks again for everybody who has already participated in the fundraising uh, that we did. And you guys, uh, your support of the church has been awesome. Um, if you're still just kind of been thinking about it, you took one of those cards home, or you still want to be part of the project, we would love that. You go to thegrovechurch.org slash give. We would love for you to continue to do that because things kind of keep coming up and unexpected things and um, you know I've been talking to Matt our youth pastor he's with the more generosity we experience the more he's able to just kind of dream and brainstorm about that space and so encourage you to continue to be a part of that my, my encouragement to you is you want to be a part of this uh, do it doing this together and also as you get towards the end of the the calendar year it's not the end of our fiscal year but it's the end of the calendar year so for a lot of you kind of do a lot of planned giving at the end and just ask you to consider um, especially our general fund is we're just trying to solidify our, our week-to-week annual budget so that we can continue to grow and, and be who God's called us to. And um, thank you for your consideration in that and for your generosity. Um, uh, so about, oh, I mean, a couple months ago, or so I guess we're thinking about Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving plans. Uh, came to my family. It's like, man, what if we went to Kansas City for Thanksgiving this year, and I would feel like Kansas City, and everybody was excited about. Oh, that sounds like a great idea! And then they're like, "What? What? What, what makes you? What makes you think Kansas City?" And I was like, "Oh, well, I mean, just by no coincidence at all, um, the Razorback basketball team happens to be playing in a two-day tournament there. I mean, but I mean, it's really more about you know family time. But if I mean, if we had some free time, we could maybe get tickets to go to the game or whatever. And oh, and we did. So um, Lauren, my middle daughter, who is 21. Uh, she and I went to the games um, Monday night and Tuesday night, and you know everybody. We, we hung out together during the day. It was it was a really fun time. And at the end of the first night, uh, we're at the game, and it's apparent that we're going to win. And and we can see that there's a section over here that has the the coaches' wives, the the the, the players' families. Like when the game's over, that's where we need to be down there because that's where cool things might happen. So. The, the games that we just kind of work our way down there, we're the, kind of there at the end when, when the game is over. And then, and then as we anticipated, different players, coaches would come out. And then Lauren and I, we kind of have, I don't know, I don't know if shtick is the right word. Kind of a, we, I could say brand. We're kind of building a brand. We've actually been on TV a couple of times, interviewed for Razorback basketball. It's, it's, it's a thing. Anyways, we love it. And so there's this one moment where the athletic director, Hunter Juracek, he comes out. He comes out, and we're fired up to see him. And so we cheer, Hunter, woo, 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 a hunter. And, and, and this is what he saw when he turned and looked at us. <laughs> so that, that's, that's, that's what he saw. And it was a great moment. It was one of my favorite moments of the week. He's like, Hunter, woo, woo. And he turns and goes, <laughs> And he just did his double take, a little smirk, and didn't look back again. So we took a selfie with him. You can see him. Way back there, that's about as close as he, <laughs> as close as he wanted to get. We took a selfie with him right there, and then the next night is the finals of the tournament. And, you know, same thing happens. You know, we we win and we start working our way down there towards the crowd. And there's some semi-famous pro athletes that are sitting courtside, and and Musselman, our coach, he comes over and he starts taking uh, photos with them. To which then we photo bombed. You can't really, I mean, I don't know if you can see, you should, if you really want to be able to see the full picture, yeah, you see the red circle there in the top left. Uh, so that's, that's just kind of what, what, what we do. I mean, we just, we had a great time and someday I'll tell you the story about how we just lingered way too long, got in trouble with the, the, uh, the people who work at the arena. It was just a lot of fun. It was just a lot of fun to pretend to be the family, get found out and then have to leave. Um, 
So here's the thing I was thinking. I actually was thinking out of it um, that night, and I've been thinking about it since then. Like, which is more kind of disorienting to see that and then be like, wait, that, that guy's a pastor? I mean, like, of a, like a church? Like a, like a real church? Is that more disorienting? Or is it you come and you meet me and I'm a pastor and then you see that later? Like, I think about that guy, how many people have been to Bud Walton, have only visited a couple of times, saw that and thought, I could go talk to that, but I think I would rather not. And just walk, again, like Hunter Juracek did when he just kind of saw us. And, <laughs> um, because here's the thing, is that we kind of put people in, in boxes. So if you're, if you're a pastor of a church, then you, then you look and you act like this. If you're, if you're a Christian, you look and act like this. You know, if you're an accountant, if you're a doctor, if you're a mom, if you're a dad, and we have these boxes that we, that we put people in. And then, being who we are, we do the same thing with God. We have, if you say, okay, we, tell me what God is like. Well, you have these, these characteristics. And, and, well, God is God, and that means that he's mean and he's judgmental and he gets really angry when I sin. And, we, and then, we put Jesus in a box, and it could be we put him in the same box that God's in, or we put him in, in his own little box. Well, he's, he's the super sweet guy with the, with, with the sheep around his, around, around his neck. And we, we craft these things, and what ultimately we make of people, and what we make of God, what we make of his son Jesus, we, we, we turn them into caricatures. And we don't allow ourselves to fully experience the, the greatness of, and uh, uh, awesomeness of who God actually is, of who Jesus is. And so we're going to be looking at a passage in Isaiah, and it's a prophecy that's talking about what the Messiah is going to be like, the person who is going to come from their perspective. He's going to be, he's going to be a king, and he's going to establish this great kingdom. He's going to save us. He's going to bring peace to our land after just years, generations, and generations of turmoil. And, and they're going to talk about who he is, and what we're going to discover here is, I think, especially for them, the people who would have read or heard Isaiah give this sermon to give this prophecy way back when, it is, it is destroying some of these stereotypical boxes. So at first, I kind of want us to, to listen to it from that perspective to make sure we're really catching really just some of the subtle nuances in the descriptions of how they're describing what Jesus is going to be Will look like, but I think ultimately, after we've painted this full picture, my guess is is that Jesus is going to have to explode out of some of these limiting boxes that we have put him in as well. So we have here in Isaiah nine chapter uh, chapter nine verses six through seven, again a description of of what it's going to be like when the Messiah, the one that's going to save Israel, is going to come. Verse six and seven. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So we have here just a description of what the Messiah, the one who's going to come and save them, is going to look like. And in that, we kind of have these four different titles in verse 6 that kind of describe these different titles, descriptions of what he's going to be like. In our Christmas series, we're just going to go through the four of those. And Mark kicked it off last week, by, and, 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 and he started with the last one. And I just... I just can't with that. Like, I was like, he, like, he knew he was going first. I was like, hey, he's like, which one do you want me to do? I was like, man, hey, you pick. And in my mind, you say, hey, you pick. Clearly, you're going to pick the first one because it's the first week. Bro, I really like the fourth one. I'm like, man, what, what is the world coming to? <laughs> anyways, but he did a great job, so we'll, we'll call it even. But um, anyways, so we have here in these descriptions um, some things that really, I don't want to say contradict one another, but are really kind of, kind of necessarily, don't necessarily easily fit together, including the one that Mark looked at last week. Because we have this description of here, like he's going to be this king and set up this kingdom, but then he's also referred to as a prince. 
Like, how, you're not the king and, and, and the prince. You're not the prince of peace. You're the, you're the king of peace. And so we have here this description of what ultimately who we know, Jesus, who Jesus is going to be. And again, some of these parts, these descriptions, it's going to take a little work for us to put them together. But when we do, at the end of the series, we're going to have an incredible visual of this awesome Jesus that we worship. But to make sure we understand what kind of what's going on around it, I think it's pretty clear. We see the first part of our six, it says, the government will be on his shoulders. Verse seven, it says, the greatness of his government, there'll be no end. He'll reign on David's throne over his kingdom. It's describing him this way. And the first, the first most obvious thing here with this passage as a whole is that Jesus is the, is the king. I mean, Jesus is the king. He's gonna, he's gonna be a king. And, and this is what they expected. They expected him. He's going to reign on David's throne. He's going to be a king just like David was. He's kind of their, their, you know, their, their idealistic king. He's going to be in that line of that type, but even greater and better. And he's going to, his, his kingdom is going to begin, and, and, and it's never going to end. It's going to be a, a different type of kingdom full of peace and justice, an eternal kingdom. And they're really, really excited about this. And this part of it would not have broken their stereotype. It would have, it would have fit their stereotype perfectly because this is what they wanted. This is what they expected. They wanted him to come and be this great and powerful king. But the reality of this is, and I make sure that we understand this, kind of a little Bible study understanding thing for us, is anytime you have prophecies like this in the Old Testament, they understood it this way. They understood that there was going to be some smaller fulfillment of this in a, in a person that was going to come in, recent, in, 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 in history, like pretty soon, right? And so they knew that this meant that there was going to be some king, probably in the next generation or so, that was going to be a better king, a great king like David. He was going to establish a kingdom of justice, and it was going to be a good time. But then they also understood this as a greater fulfillment. You don't look at this. You don't describe any normal king as mighty God, everlasting father. But they also understood that there would be a fuller fulfillment of this when the Messiah comes. But for us, having looked at it and heard what Jesus had to say, what Jesus communicated to us was, hey, even the things that are being said about me are only being partially fulfilled now, but will be fulfilled more fully later. I mean, he is a king and he's established his kingdom forever, but he's not really... It's not really as tangible now as it will be, Jesus says, when he comes back again. And so there's kind of these, for lack of a better word, there's kind of these three phases of this. But they experienced it as two, that we're going to have a king that's going to come now. He's going to be pretty cool. But then ultimately this king is going to come. And he's going to be the one that saves us. And we're not going to have to deal with all these outside forces anymore. And there's going to be peace and justice, both internally and externally. And this is what... They're incredibly excited about. And I think it's important for us, because even though it kind of fits perfectly within their box, for some of us it may not fit perfectly with ours. Like some of us just kind of don't think of Jesus. We think of Jesus as miracle worker. We think of him as nice guy. We think of him as moral teacher. But you gotta, you got to add and make sure that you include king in that. His, we, don't, we don't follow Jesus just simply because it seems like a good idea. We don't follow Jesus simply because, well, I mean, you know, I mean, he's, his teaching seems to be pretty good. and He is worthy of it. He is a king. He is owed this by us. They understood that. And I think it's important for us to understand it too. I think sometimes our notions and our ideas of our independence, our freedom, you know, I think can sometimes kind of clog things up sometimes between, wait, God is the, he's the king, he's the ruler, and what I give him, I voluntarily give it, but it is also owed him because of who he is. And that's who Jesus is. He's a king and he is worthy and deserving of our worship and our, us following him. But this week in particular... We're going to be looking at this first one, this first phrase, wonderful counselor. And I believe that this descriptor in particular, even amongst the four of them, is the one that is going to be kind of the most, wait, what? For the people who are trying to put together 
and, and put together a, a full picture here of what Isaiah and ultimately what God is saying about what the Messiah is going to be because it describes him obviously as a king but then also a counselor. So Jesus is the king but he's a king and a counselor. He's a king and a counselor. And we use that word counselor and we have some particular images that come to our head. I say counselor, you may immediately go, oh, like a, like a therapist, like Jesus is our therapist. Like, no, not exactly. A uh, counselor, you know, it's somebody who just gives advice. He's, a, he's an advice giver. And I'm like, I, I don't want to discount either of those two things that Jesus is. I mean, he, he will comfort you like a, like a therapist would and help you go through dark times walk through dark times like a therapist would. And he is an advice giver. He would give advice. He would do, he'll, he, he does that. But this word counselor, for them, it's going to mean something different to them. I mean, for, I guess probably in our political world, it probably make it, the, the word that would make the most sense would be that Jesus is also a chief of staff to the president. That's what a counselor is. It's like, it's like the person who's right there next to the king, but it's a subservient role. So we're describing him as a king, but also as the counselor, which would be kind of second. And, it, and it's, a, it's, it's a description that doesn't particularly make sense. Well, he's subservient to God the Father. God the Father's not looking for counsel. No one counsels him. I'm not talking about that. It's talking about the role that he plays with us. That he's not just simply a king, but he is also someone who is going to come alongside of the people that he rules like a trusted advisor. Like, and not just someone who, as a king, who's giving out wisdom. You can imagine that. He's going to be a king who gives out wisdom. That's not what this is saying. It is describing him as someone who is both going to rule and is going to, let's just say, sacrifice his position, humble himself in a way to support the people that he leads. Which is incredible. I mean, it's why it's, it's, why it's the prophecy, it's why it's the Bible, it's why it comes from God, right? It's just a beautiful foreshadowing of the complexity of who Jesus is. Um, you know, Philippians describes it as, as, as having a, he has a quality with God, but empties himself. And as he empties himself, he just, he just, he becomes a person, and not just a person, but a servant. And not just a servant, but a servant who sacrifices himself. So that, so that we can live. Humbles himself and experiences this brutal death. He wasn't born like a king. He was born in a barn. He didn't live the life of a prince that gets to become king. He lived the life of, the, of, of, of a carpenter's son, an insignificant person in an incredibly poor house who, who has nothing about him that says royalty, that says position. And then in the way that he lives, in the way that he leads, in the way that he is our king, it's, it's, it's with humility. And then ultimately we see incredible sacrifice where he lays down his life for us. And so we have a picture here of, of a God who is, who is king. He's king. But he's also willing to humble himself to be your counselor, to be a right-hand man of support and wisdom for you. And while this might have been particularly shocking or weird for them, we have plenty of evidence of this. The Holy Spirit is described, this, described as this in Isaiah chapter 11. It says, The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom, of understanding, the spirit of counsel, same word, of might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. The Holy Spirit is described as playing this role as, as God, but as a, as, as a counselor, as a strong support. But then in John 14, Jesus says this, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. So that word advocate, depending on your translation, it may say comforter, but essentially it's the Greek word, but it's the same idea of a counselor, of, of this kind of right-hand person, this strong support 
to help you navigate your life. And so he's the king, you're the subject, and he's your counselor. And so we have just this weird, that's not a great word, contradictory is the wrong word. I'm just going to use the word beautiful. This beautiful picture of an incredibly complex Jesus who both rules and supports. And this is the role that he is wanting to play in your life. Again, it's, 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 more, it's, more than just, it's more than just an advisor. I want you to feel something stronger than that, but also more humble than that. But he is so invested in you as a person and wanting you to thrive in your walk with God, to thrive in your life, that he wants to rule, he wants to, he wants to lead you and also be this incredible support. And if that's all that this name, this title for Jesus had been, it would have, it's still a little bit, whoa, okay, well, that's kind of that's different, that's kind of weird, especially for them. But that's not all that said. What it says is, is that he's a wonderful counselor. He's a wonderful counselor. And so we'll just say it this way, and then I'll explain what it means. So Jesus, he's king. He's a king and a counselor. But he's a counselor of wonders. And it's important for us to understand kind of the, the, the linguistic thing that happens here. If you look at it, it's actually two nouns together. He will be called, and we'll just use this, he will be called wonder counselor. It's not wonderful like an adjective. It's two nouns next to each other. Wonder counselor. And so at that point, if you're hearing this or you're reading it for the first time, you don't because your translation, my translation, turned into an adjective. Oh, he's a counselor. That's wonderful. I think I know what that means. No, no, no. He's a wonder counselor. Wait. What? It's intentionally designed to make you slow down and go, what is he talking about? What does this mean? We are intended, it is intended for us to slow down and say, what is a wonder counselor? A counselor wonder. Wonder, what is that? And so we make it simple, we just call it wonderful. And I think it's important at this point that we make sure that we even understand what wonderful means. Even if we decide this is a great translation, a counselor that is wonderful. We need to make sure that we are precise about what we mean. If you've been around, you know that I get this way sometimes. I get really, it's really important that we be precise about words, that we understand what they mean, because sometimes by us being too vague about words, then we can use it, we can, we can miss something. So if we say something's, hey, then that's wonderful. You think, well, it's good news. It's, it's a good thing. It's, a, it's, 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 it's nice. It's good. It's great. But that's not what it means. But here's what I want to do is I'm trying to be precise about words. I don't want to be that guy. And sometimes, I don't, I don't know if you've ever been around this past, pastor like this, right? I don't, and I don't call it, it's the worst kind of pastor. It's not the worst because there's way worse. But this, it's, it's on the list, right? There you get the pastor is like, I hear the way you talk. And I hear you use the word awesome. And you use the word awesome. Like, you need to understand only God is awesome because awesome it means, it means full of awe. And you, you're like, your team wins a sport, wins a game. That's awesome. No, it's not awesome. <laughs> Only God is awesome. You get a little bit of extra money. Oh, man, that's awesome. It's not awesome. Only God is awesome. Let's pray. Please stop. Just don't. Use your words however you want in your normal colloquial, just kind of people talking kind of way. But we need to stop. And this is what it's trying to do. It's trying to stop. It's like, this counselor is wonderful. What is wonderful? What does it really mean? Full of wonder. Wonder. Something that when you see it makes you wonder. Like, how? How? How, how is that? Why is that? How is that even possible? I don't even understand what is happening here. I, I am in such wonder about this. And so in that sense, it really is closer to the word awesome. It's something that when you see it, you just kind of go, what? 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 In fact, this word wonder, the only time it is ever used in all of the Old Testament, it is used to describe exclusively things that God does. The wonders of God. 
God is doing something that is a wonder. Only God, nothing that you have ever done, nothing that I've ever done, nothing that any of the other, just people in the Old Testament, nothing they have ever done has been described as a wonder. And so by the definition of this particular word, we are not capable of being wonderful. I can't do a wonder. I can do regular, and then God does wonders. And so he is a counselor, but he is a counselor of wonders. He is a counsel that it's not just life advice. When you listen to his counsel, when you follow his counsel, when you allow him to be your counselor, expect wonders. Expect something full of wonder to happen. Not good, not great, not pleasing, not nice. Wonder. He is a wonder counselor. And I'm not, I'm not making too big a deal of this because I'm telling you the way that it is written. It is meant for us to stop and say, Because I think if we're going to break God out of his box, I think we understand him as a counselor. And I, I'm going to read the Bible. I'm going to read a passage. Jesus is going to tell me something about money. Jesus is going to tell me something about loving people, taking care of the poor. And I'm going to read that, and I'm going to be like, oh, okay, okay. I need to take that advice and I need to be different with my money. I need to be kinder to people. I need to love the hurting a little bit better. I'm going to take that counsel. We have, we have that. But here's the thing that I know. I know that there are many of you that the thing that it is that you're going through, you don't need advice to get through it. You need a wonder. The only way that you are going to navigate this, the only way that you are going to get to this next place, the only way that you're going to experience the peace, the justice, the life that the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish, that the Messiah, the King, is going to come directly into your life and bring hope and life to you. The only way that that's going to happen is not because you get a little bit better life advice. You need a wonder. And you think, boy, you, don't you just don't understand. You don't understand what's going on with me. I'll never be able to blah, 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 blah. You don't understand what's going on with my spouse. He, she, she'll never be able to da, 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 da. My kids, da, 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 da. My family, da, da. There's no my finances, da, da. There's nothing. There's, there's nothing. I've tried it all. I followed all the advice. You don't understand what's happened to my life. And there's no way out. But the wonder counselor is there. Do you believe and trust and follow the counselor of wonders? Or are you just trying to make it with the best advice possible? Because just even in this overarching picture of Jesus as a king and in these two words, wonder and counselor, we've, we've painted a picture here of a very complex Jesus that we worship. Well, if he's a king, he's not, he's not my guy. If he's my guy, he's not the king. No, he's both. But he's also, he's, he's full of wonders. And if I can just figure out what it means to listen and follow this king, this wonder, this counselor. That's where the peace is. That's where the justice is. That's where the life is. It begins first and foremost with the gospel. That I recognize that my sin has hurt and upset and separated me from the king. And I owe him better than what I've given him. 
And so I confess. But also this king, as my counselor, submitted himself and sacrificed and gave his life for me. And that is the king that I follow. That is the counselor, the support that is with me. And if I will learn to listen to his voice a little bit better, to trust and follow him a little bit better, there are wonders. Both now and even more fully to come. They experienced it a little. Jesus brought more. And there's even more over here. So I just encourage you. We haven't talked about this in a while because COVID stuff, but we have a response area in the back, a place where there's individual communion, there's prayer candles, there's people that love to pray with you. There's a cross where you can pray. Man, I just encourage you, man. If you if you need the gospel, go back there and pray and talk to him. If you need to connect better for, with this counselor, go back there and just respond. If, if you need some wonders in your life, Pray and ask and see what God will do. But whether you stay here at your seat, you go back there wherever it is you are, let's worship and let's pray for one another that the counselor of wonder will show up in our lives this week. Let me pray.